Good morning. I am, I have been told my whole preaching career that I'm horrible about talking about myself, so I'm just going to talk about Jesus today mostly, and hopefully uh, anything I share about myself will just bring glory to the Lord. So if we could pray together before we get going, let's do that. Lord, we are just in crazy times right now, but we serve a God who is a king of kings and a lord of lords. Lord, help us, help us to just hold to you, Lord, to cling fast to you like the woman just knew if she could just touch the hem of your robe that that, that flow of blood would be stopped. The one that she had gone to all the physicians for, the, the one that she had looked everywhere for a healing from, she knew if she could just touch you, if she could just hold on to you for just a moment, that you would change everything. And so, Lord, help us this morning to hold on to you. Lord, help the cares of this world, help the, the thorns that are choking us out and the weeds, Lord, and the, the sun that threatens to scorch us, Lord, and the elections and all this other stuff. Lord, I just pray that you would eliminate that. And Lord, that we would see you not as a six-foot Jesus this morning, but as a 600-foot Jesus. Lord, I know that there are so many Goliaths in my friends' lives in this room right now, Lord, and I just pray that that stone that is cut without hands, that chief cornerstone would just slay those giants this morning. Lord, we're coming to your word. We have come here this morning to meet with you. Lord, I've come here to meet with you. Lord, I pray that you would meet with us. Would you speak to us and not be silent this morning, Lord? Would you open our eyes, Lord, so we can see you as you are, Lord? I pray as Elisha prayed over his servant when they were surrounded by the enemy, that you prayed that you would, you would open his eyes so that he could see that your armies were surrounding. Lord, help us to see how you are in control right now, Lord. Help us to see how you are all satisfying beyond anything else that Satan can offer us right now. I pray this in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen. My text this morning is going to be Genesis 3, if you want to turn in your Bibles there with me. But probably my favorite verse in the entire Bible was written by a man named David. He's my favorite man in the Bible. So much pain, so much suffering, so much power that God displayed through that man. And in Psalm chapter 16, 11, the psalmist David writes this beautiful verse he says, in God's presence, in God's presence is fullness of joy. And my question for you this morning, if, if that's where fullness of joy is, in God's presence, my question for you this morning is where are you? If God's presence is a, is a place that we can be in, not necessarily a physical place that we can be in, but a, a spiritual place, kind of like Paul could, 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 could be full of joy, even though he's writing to the Philippians from prison. It's not necessarily a place that we're in, but, but, but a physical place that we're in, but it can be a spiritual place that we're in. Like James says, count it all joy, brethren when you fall into various trials, right? And so we can, we can be in this place, not necessarily physically, but spiritually, where no matter what is going on around us, the storms of life, every, the, the winds just beating against us, the rain coming down, that if our house is built on the rock Jesus, that it doesn't matter, that we can still have fullness of joy. So if there's a place if there's a place, and, God, and David says this, that place is in God's presence. So if this place that we can be in, in God's presence, is fullness of joy, that's the barometer. If you're in God's presence, what you're going to have is this unshakable peace that surpasses understanding. You're going to have fullness of joy in God's presence. My question for you is, are you there today? Where are you? Now, I know I'm preaching probably one of the most well-known texts in the Bible, and maybe it's even simple, but you know, everything after Genesis 3 is God showing us how he's going to fix what happened in Genesis 3 and what waits for us. So really, Genesis 3 is everything that stands between us and the goodness of God. 
Let, let me break down the context to us just, just real quick. In the beginning, God created everything, right? The heavens, the earth. He said, let there be light. He started creating everything like elk for me to hunt. And as he created these wonderful animals for me to hunt, I'm sorry if you're not a hunter, but if you eat meat, you're a hypocrite. And Paul also says, he who eats only vegetables is weak. So you have that going against you too. That's the Bible, that's not me. I'm just saying this morning. But the first couple chapters of Genesis is all about what? God creating everything. Nothing existed without God. There is nothing good without God. There is no life without God. There is no air in your lungs without God. There is no heartbeat in your chest. You don't even exist without God. The pleasures you feel, the amazing things you look forward to, there is nothing without God. And everything that you value, everything that you want to do, everything that we experience that's good in this world comes from the only one who can give good gifts, and that is our God. And in the first two chapters of Genesis, he lays out everything that he created. Everything he created. And he looked at it after he created it, and he said it was good. And then he got to man, and he says, there's something going wrong here. This guy needs something. And then he makes this beautiful woman. And she must have been very, very good, right? Very, very good. And we think about the world that God created then, right? We read that, and we think about the world that God created then. And we look at now. Is there a difference? If everything was good, very good, can you think of anything that's not good right now? How many of you are voting for Biden-Harris? You don't have to raise your hands. There's an endless list of no good. There's an endless list of no good right now. So what changed it, what, what changed it all? What is it that changed it all? Well, Genesis 3 is what changed it all. And, and, and we all, we all want good, don't we? Does anybody want their life to be bad just by a show of hands? How many of you want to just be miserable? Can I get a show? How many of you want to be happy in life? How many of you want to be happy? I mean, isn't that, in essence, isn't that what America is founded on, right? Life, liberty, and the pursuit of, what is it? A happiness. I mean, isn't it, what we, isn't it what we chase after? I mean, we all have different means to that end, but the end is happiness. Maybe, maybe the means is, is a successful career where you're advancing, advancing, advancing so that, so that you can earn more money, so that you can, you, you can create a legacy, so that you can create financial freedom, so that you can enjoy life, so that you can be what? Happy. And it really is the pursuit of every man's life. You know, there's this quote, I don't know if you know the author, he's kind of obscure, his name was C.S. Lewis. Have you ever heard of him? He had this quote, he said, human history is the long, terrible story of man trying to find something besides God to make him happy. Human history is the long, terrible story of man trying to find something besides God to make him happy. And, and maybe, that's, maybe that's your life, right? Maybe that's your life. Maybe you've grown up as a Christian, but you look for all these other experiences. You look for all these other things to make you happy. You look for something else besides God that can bring more satisfaction to you than God. You believe that God is not an all-satisfying God and that he can't superiorly satisfy you over anything else in this world. And this, my friends, is the lie of Satan. This is the, not the lie that he just fed to Adam and Eve, but this is the very thing that separates us from the presence of God. This is the very thing. And if in God's presence is fullness of joy, remind you, the very thing that we are all pursuing. Aren't we all pursuing joy? We all raised our hands that we all want to be happy. You've got to be some kind of weirdo to not want to be happy. Because it's, it's wired in us. It's why from the beginning, God built us for relationship with him. And only he can satisfy us completely. And so all Satan has to do, all Satan has to do is tell you that something else will satisfy you more than God. And if you believe that lie, what it's going to do is it's going to separate you from the presence of God. And what it's going to do is separate you from fullness of joy and everything that you're actually pursuing. Let's get into the text today. I've laid enough of a foundation. Genesis chapter 3. Life was good. Actually, verse 25 of chapter 2 is right before there. Genesis is the first book in your Bibles if you're new to the Bible. Genesis chapter 2 verse 25. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. I mean, the world sounded good. 
Man and woman, naked together, in a garden, happy all the time. Ver- chapter 3, verse 1. Now the serpent, the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Verse 4. Then the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree that was desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings, and they heard. What did they hear? They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? This is my text this morning. And we might even cover just a little bit more of Genesis 3. But this problem that Adam and Eve began, this dialogue with Satan that Adam and Eve began is a dialogue that continues to this day with every person in this room and every person in Colorado Springs and every person in the world because Satan wants nothing more than to fill hell with us. Now the serpent, this serpent, was more cunning. What does that tell us about the serpent? You ever talk to somebody that's a good liar? And you don't know if they're telling the truth or not? And before you even know they're a liar, everything they say, you're like, wow, that's amazing. That's incredible. Wow, you really killed a grizzly bear with your bare hands? That is incredible. At that point, I start believing they're liars. Because only I've done that. But the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field. So what does that tell me? So if there are really good liars out there, what does Jesus say? He says that Satan is the father of lies. That means he's the OG. He is the best liar that has ever been. So have you ever been deceived? Have you ever been gullible when somebody has told you a lie and you're like, oh, well, that, that seems right. Yeah, I guess, I guess so. Well, that person pales in comparison to Satan himself. Now, Satan is more cunning than anyone that has ever walked the face of this earth. So if you ever get in a dialogue with Satan, you are up against the best liar. He is the father of lies. The serpent, he was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, Well, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, she added this part, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Just a, just a side note here. Um, the Pharisees had a hard time with Jesus, too, because he would hang out with sinners and tax collectors. He would go and he would eat and drink with them. He was even called a, a wine bibber. Do you remember that? And a glutton. Um, in, in Psalm chapter 1, it says what? Verse 1, it says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of the sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. It says nothing about, you know, we're to be in this world, but not of this world. Why I say that is because Eve says, God told me I'm not supposed to eat it, nor shall I touch it. Well, God only told her, don't eat it. And sometimes in a pursuit for holiness, this is a major side note on this text for me, 
But sometimes in a pursuit of holiness, we actually begin to add things to God's word. And actually when we do that, we begin to go counter to God's mission. Because Jesus came, Luke 19, 10, the Son of Man came to seek and save that which is lost. No, you're not supposed to walk in the counsel of God, um, the ungodly. No, you're not supposed to stand in the path of sinners. But it's okay to cross the path of sinners, to intersect them on their way to hell, to stop them from going to hell. And the only thing standing between sinners and hell is is the gospel and us who have been commissioned to take that gospel forward. So be careful not to add unholy, in your mind, holy regulations to God's word. God just said, don't eat it, not don't touch it. Eve added that. And that's a step where Satan can get in and all of a sudden begin to poison you and take you off mission from what God has for you. Let me, I digress, let's just keep going. Then the serpent said to her, so there's this interaction going on. She knows what God wants. What's God, what God has told her. And then the serpent said to the woman, well, you will not surely die. You will not surely die. And how true is that? Think about it. She, she ate the fruit, and did she die? Eventually. You see, Proverbs 14, 12 says what? There's a way, there's a way that seems right to a man but its end is the way of death. Now, I want you to catch that, right? There's a way that seems right. What, what, what does that mean? Let's just start with that. There's a way that seems right. That, that means you look at your options, and you think, this is my best option, and you're completely convinced. Has anybody in here ever been wrong about something in their life? And the rest of you are liars, right? <laughs> There's a way that seems right, but its end, its end, I know that's just a subtle thing, but think about it. Not the beginning of it, not the middle of it, but the end of it is death. Look, nobody gets married thinking, you know what? I can't wait for five years from now when we get divorced and I lose half of everything I've ever earned. Do they know they're fully convinced that the person that they're marrying is going gonna, gonna to work out, right? Nobody has ever started doing drugs thinking, man, I can't wait for a couple of years from now when I am so addicted that I'm doing who knows what to try and keep up with my addiction. No, at the time it seemed right. Right for what? Right to bring peace into their life, maybe. Right to be, to, to be accepted. Well, Ephesians 1, chapter, chapter 1, verse 6 says that we are accepted by Jesus. Man, how much do we do for acceptance because acceptance makes us happy? Did you know that the God of the universe accepts you through Jesus Christ? The one who created it all accepts you through Jesus Christ. And there's this way that seems right to us, but not the beginning of it, not the middle of it, but the end of it is the way of death. And so here is Satan, and here is Eve in this dialogue together, and the serpent said, you will not surely die. And how often have we done things that people tell us, and the Bible tells us, God, the scriptures are breathed out by God. This is God's word to us. How often have we done things that God says they're going to kill you and you do them and it doesn't kill you? You watch that thing on your computer screen. It's not going to kill my marriage. Well, the beginning of it may not. But I do enough counseling with men and women watching things that they shouldn't be watching and the marriages that die. No, it might not die right away. Eve didn't die right away. That puff on that pipe might not kill you right away. But I'm telling you, my friends, this is the greatest lie there is, that it won't kill you because it will kill you, and it kills you immediately. It just may take a couple of minutes for you to die. You know, when you shoot an elk with an arrow, I told Garrett I wasn't going to use a lot of hunting analogies, but that's all I got. When you shoot an elk with an arrow, it doesn't die right away. It runs off. And that, that weapon begins to work in that animal. And slowly, over the next minutes or hours, that thing dies. That's what happens when we let sin into our life. That's what happens when we let sin into our life. Check this out. The sa Satan says, you will not surely die, for God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. In other words, what, what, what Satan is saying here is that there exists 
something that God is holding back from you that's, that could satisfy you more. And all you have to do is reach out and grab it. That was the story of my life. That was actually like a motto of mine. I always told people before I became a Christian. You can have anything you want in this world. All you have to do is reach out and grab it. I did that with money. I did that with women. I had a wife. But hey, you want something else, don't you? It's going to make you happy. Without it, how can you be happy? How far will you go to be happy? What will you compromise to be happy? Who will you hurt to be happy? It's not necessarily that the person wants to hurt somebody, but it's the hurting of them is, it ends up being a means to the end. It's not that somebody necessarily wants to be a compulsive liar, but without the lie, they don't believe that they can become happy, so they, they're, they become slaves to these things. They become slaves to these things. And, and Satan says this, God knows. God knows that in the day that you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Now, knowing there, I was just, I've taught this text actually quite a few times, and yesterday, I was studying it again at Garrett's kitchen table. I don't know if you can call it a kitchen. He's in a new house. It's not really a kitchen. But I was sitting there studying this, and I was like, knowing. That's interesting. I wonder if that's the same knowing that's a chapter over. The word for knowing here in the Hebrew is yada. You guys are familiar with that, right? Like yada, yada, yada. Can you guys say yada? Yada. Well, over in Genesis chapter 4, it says, now Adam knew or yadded Eve, his wife. Do you know what that means? Because they had a child afterwards. So do you understand what yada means? Like they yadded one another? They went and yada, had yada? It was just a yada time. Not yoda, but yada. The same, forgive me if I went too far with that, the same word is used here that you will yada good and evil. You will know it. What is that? It's like an experiential knowledge, right? You're going to have an experience. You're going to have an experience by doing this that's going to satisfy you more than God himself. Do you see it right there? I mean, it's just crazy. It just blew up to me yesterday. You're going to have, this experience is going to bring a satisfaction to you that God can't. It's what we believe, isn't it? You may not think that way, but anytime we make a decision, when we have Jesus in front of us and we have this, this experience that we know that is dangerous for us and we choose the experience that we know is dangerous because it's a sinful experience, whenever we choose that over Jesus, what we're believing is that we're going to have an experience that can bring more satisfaction than Jesus can himself. And this is the lie that Satan throws out in front of every one of us. This is the essence of sin. Do you see it here? The essence of sin is believing that something can satisfy you more than God himself and then pursuing it. Satan, the temptation, this is the temptation from Satan, that there is an experience out there that, that will bring superior satisfaction to our Savior. He can't, he can't satisfy as much as this experience can. He can't satisfy as much as this job can. He can't satisfy as much as this relationship can. He can't satisfy as much as this drug can or as much as this computer screen can. Our God is incompetent compared to this experience. And that's the temptation. Now, James tells us that temptation is not sin. It's when we accept the invitation. It's when we believe that something can satisfy us more than God, and then we pursue it. That's when sin is conceived. And when sin is, after sin is conceived, it grows up and it bears what? Death. That's what James 1 teaches us. I'm not going to go there right now. So the woman, here's her response. And quite frankly, every one of us have had this exact same response. Every one of us has been tempted and has fallen because there's only one person who's ever lived perfectly, and his name was what? Jesus. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make her wise, she took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave to, gave to her husband, and he ate. Okay, so here's the response. This is what separated good from bad, right here. In our lives, the same thing happens. Every time we're presented with this lie, 
that there's an experience out there that can satisfy more than God. We have a choice that we have to make. And the choice that we make either brings us into the presence of God, where fullness of joy is, or hides us from the presence of God, where shame is. Let me, let me show you in the text here. So when the woman saw that the tree was good, verse 6, for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit. Now, I saw three points in this yesterday. First off, good for food. Okay, well, God said, you guys can have any tree you want in the garden. When the psalmist David in Psalm 23, verse 5 says, my cup runs over. When I think of my cup running over, I think of this huge garden and God says, you can have anything you want. That's like cup running over. You walk into Walmart, you can have anything you want. If you shop at Walmart, you walk into Cabela's, you can have anything you want. That's your cup running over. And she has everything that she wants in God, yet she sees that this other tree, this other experience is good for food. Let, let, me, let me put it this way. She saw this thing as better than God, and it was good for food. Well, Jesus in John chapter 6, best chapter in the world, I think, John chapter 6 tells the people, don't labor for the food that perishes, but for that which endures to everlasting life. Jesus also says, my flesh is food. Jesus also says in John chapter 6 verse 35 that I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never hunger, and he who believes in me will never thirst. I am the bread of life. He is superior to any other food that we could ever find to nourish our souls. He is superior to money. He is superior to power. He is, he is superior to absolutely everything. He is the food that doesn't perish. That experience that you think might bring you more satisfaction than God, it will go away. You may have a picture of it sometime. But it is fleeting. It is fleeting. When we eat from Jesus, we will never hunger. Yet we settle for a meal that goes away. She saw that it was, the tree was pleasant to the eyes. It was pleasant to the eyes. What does that mean? It was pleasing. It looked pleasurable. It was exciting. Pleasure is a very strong motivator, isn't it? I mean, I've been gone from my wife for like two weeks now. I'm looking forward to getting home tonight. Pleasure. Pleasure drives us. I mean, let's speak openly about this because if I'm vague, if I'm vague, then maybe we won't apply it to our lives necessarily. And I'm praying that the Spirit may apply it to you in the way that it needs to be done. But seriously, pleasure drives us so much. And she saw, she saw that it was pleasant to the eyes. Well, David says in Psalm 16, 11, that at God's right hand are pleasures forever more. There is nothing in this world that can bring as much pleasure as that sitting at the right hand of God. Stephen, when he was being stoned to death in Acts, what did he see that kept him anchored there? He saw the glory of God and he saw Jesus standing at the right hand. It didn't matter what came at him. It didn't matter that he was being stoned to death. He was seeing Jesus at the right hand of God and being at the right hand of God is where pleasures are forevermore. There is no pleasure on this earth that you can ever experience like being in the presence of God. And if you've never been in the presence of God, you don't know what I'm talking about. But you, what you do know what I'm talking about is this that all the pleasures that you've had in your life have all come and gone and left you wanting for more, and Jesus will never leave you wanting for more. He will fill you to overflowing. You see, this is what I believed before I was a Christian. So m maybe you guys are like me, and maybe you're not. I don't know. I'll just share what I was like. I had this notion when I was a kid that if I could make $100,000 a year that that is when I would have arrived, and that's when I would be satisfied, and that's when I could do everything I wanted to do. And then I got to $100,000 a year, and I realized that I had been wrong about the number. It needed to be at least 150000 Stupid. I didn't calculate for inflation at the time when I was thinking about this, right? Or the coronavirus or anything else. And so then 
I got to 150 and I realized there must have been some like accounting errors in what I was thinking because I definitely need at least 200 to be happy. But then I got to 200 and I realized, okay, somehow I missed something because I need at least 250 or 300,000 to be happy. And I got there and I still wasn't happy. My wife and I, we had this manufacturing company um, and I was hunting all over the world, traveling all the time, having a blast. But every time I would get somewhere, it never measured up to what I was hoping I would get out of it. And that's the reality. So often we think if we can just get somewhere, we're going to get out of it what we hope. But unless that somewhere is in the presence of God, you will never get out of it what you hope to get out of it. It'll always leave you empty, always leave you wanting for more. And so no, I realized that no amount of money, no amount of anything, and I'll try and be tempered in how I say it, but no amount of anything would ever bring me satisfaction like I really wanted it to. And it's the same thing, right? I would see that these things would be pleasant to the eyes, that I, I would desire them, but nothing would ever actually please me. David says in Psalm 1611, at God's right hand, is pleasures forevermore. And she saw the tree was desirable. It was desirable for what? To make one wise. It was desirable. Well, then I think of the psalmist in Psalm 37, verse 4. He says, if we delight ourselves in the Lord, he will give us the what? The desires of our heart. Now, I don't say that in a name it and claim it prosperity gospel, like he'll just give us whatever we want. Because when you are delighted with the Lord, what's happening is you're in lockstep with the Lord. You're going where the Lord is going. You're serving the Lord, and he's just, he's just blessing you, and your desire becomes his desire. And all of a sudden, if it's his desire, he's going to give it to you. And when you, are, when you are operating in the purpose that God has crafted you for, God knew you before the foundations of the world. He has prepared good works for you to walk out. And when you start walking in what God has created you for, oh my goodness, talk about, talk about the most unbelievable feeling. Talk about pleasures forevermore. Talk about satisfaction. Talk about goodness. Talk about the desires of your heart being fulfilled. That's where you want to be. That's where you want to be. You want to be in the presence of God. And she saw these things, and what she thought, she thought this, that there is a situation, there is an experience that can satisfy me more than God, and I see it right in front of me, and all I have to do is reach out. And eat it. I find it interesting that she ate it, and that's what killed all of mankind. And I can go into this just doctrinally, but I'm not going to completely right now because I'm probably going to go two hours. She ate it, and it killed him. And Jesus says in John chapter 6, you've got to eat my flesh and drink my blood, and that is the only way to eternal life. And the only way we all have eaten of this fruit, the only way back to good is to eat from the gospel, to eat from Jesus Christ himself, to eat Jesus. And what does it mean to eat? Everybody was tripping out. They're like looking at Jesus. What does he mean we got to eat him? He's only like five foot six, and there's thousands of us. How are we going to divide this guy up? Probably be about as small as our little communion cups here. But what does it mean to eat something? It means to see that it can actually nourish your body and to accept it in, doesn't it? That burger, you're like, okay, that's going to nourish my body and keep me alive. You take the burger, you take a bite out of it, you swallow it. What does it do? It goes down into your stomach and it nourishes your body. You're accepting that nourishment in. And every one of us, our soul is crying out for a Jesus burger, right? Crying out for it. We're cra our soul is craving Jesus because we have been designed to be with Jesus. And the only way to get Jesus back into us is to accept him back into us. And we have his presence. So she takes it. She eats it. She doesn't just eat it. She hands it to her own Bray, and he eats it too. And what happens? Verse 7. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. Now I come back to verse 25 of chapter 2. They were naked and not ashamed. This nakedness, as we see through the rest of the Bible, this nakedness, wherever we see nakedness, it really represents shame. Shame has now come in to mankind. And how embarrassing is it when we think something's going to satisfy us and we become shame? How many, how, I don't even know, 
Every one of us has a different one, right? But so, so I do a lot of counseling with people that have gotten just deep into drugs and they come out of it and their families are all destroyed and the relationships are all destroyed and they're sitting there just ashamed. They, they, they're not confident anymore. They can't even hardly look up. That's what happens when we get to the end of the experience, right? The shame that comes. The shame from getting caught being a liar. The shame getting caught from what you're watching on your computer or your smartphone now. Isn't that shameful when you've been caught for that? I remember the first time I got caught, I was like 12 years old. Man, I was ashamed. Shame. Oh, and shame is nothing compared to hell. Shame is nothing compared to hell. The shame of your marriage falling apart and you have to explain to everybody why your wife just left you for uh, another woman. I mean, these are real things that Garrett and I counsel in the church. How shameful would that be? This is, the, this is the shame. And so they real, their eyes are opened and they realize, okay, nothing satisfies like God, but now God said that I'm going to die. Where do I go from here? So what did they do? They knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves covering. Well, here's the problem with trying to cover up our sin is nothing that we can do can actually cover up what we have done. You know the problem with fig leaves? Fig leaves don't last very long. I mean, how long does a fig leaf loincloth last? Think about that. They're going to either dry up or rot off. I mean, then you got to make another one again. I find it fascinating at the end of the chapter, God makes the first sacrifice, kills an animal, and covers them with skin. And we're covered by the blood of Jesus, the blood of Jesus. But they make themselves fig coverings, and then they heard something. What did they hear? The thing that they didn't want to hear. Daddy came home. Daddy came home, didn't he? You know, there's a reality for them and there's a reality for us is every one of us is going to stand before the Lord. I don't care if you're a Christian or not a Christian. Every one of us is going to stand before the Lord. And let me tell you, you're going to want to hide, but there's not going to be any beds to hide under when you stand before the Lord. You may not believe in God, but you will believe in him when you're standing face to face with him. Where are you? Are you going to be happy to be seeing his face or are you going to be trying to find a bed to hide under from the Lord? So they heard, what did they hear? They heard the sound of the, the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day and Adam and his wife hid themselves from what? What did they hide themselves from? What did Adam and Eve hide themselves from? The presence of the Lord. Now, let's just stop and just talk about what we've been talking about this whole time. Where is fullness of joy found? What were they pursuing? They were pursuing fullness of joy. And what were they hiding from? Does anybody else think that's crazy? Have you ever thought of hiding from the very thing that you're pursuing? Let me give an illustration. Worship leader, your name again. Josh. Josh, if you were chasing after a million dollars and I walked into the room right now with a briefcase full of a million dollars and I was calling out your name, Josh, I have a million dollars for you and you began to hide from me. Don't they put people like that in straitjackets? <laughs> Think about it for a second. Hiding from the very thing you're pursuing is crazy. If our entire lives, everybody in here said that they want to be happy. If our entire lives, everything that we work for is all based around this end that we desire to be happy, why would we hide from the very one who possesses everything that we're pursuing? Why would we hide from that? Yet we do. Not just people who aren't Christians, but people who are Christians. How often have we hidden from the presence of God because we're ashamed of what we've done? Maybe like Peter, you remember when Peter denied Jesus three times and Jesus is sitting there and he keeps asking him, do you love me? And Peter had to be thinking, how can things ever go back the way they were? And he just wanted to hide. And he's just, yeah, I love you. I love you. Don't ever hide from the very thing that we are pursuing. We are pursuing fullness of joy, yet we pursue everything but God who is the possessor of it. We pursue every experience we can, looking for what God alone can provide. They hid from the presence of the Lord. Then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? 
That's my question. What happened is this for me. I was making hunting videos at the time, and Garrett's pastoral care pastor wanted to buy one of my hunting videos, and churches were just <sighs> to me. And he asked me if I can sell him a hunting video, but I needed to deliver it to the church. Well, it was $25, and you'd be surprised what I would do for $25. So I decided I would go into a church. That's how far I, would, that's how far I was willing to go for $25. I would walk into a church. Can you believe that? So I walk in, and so my culture is a little bit different maybe than your culture. Up there, we don't like Californians. Um, and my best friends are from California now, but we don't like them. So anyway, Garrett and this whole crew, they come up from California and plant this church, and all I'd heard was all these weird things. They were this Kool-Aid church. Garrett was this weirdo. And so I walk in, right, and I go back, and it feels like a hospital to me because it's just weird. And I walk back to Scott's office, and, and, and I walk in, and Scott is sitting on a bouncy ball with gray spiked hair. And I was just like, dude, the stories are true. These guys are Fruit Loops. <laughs> and then Garrett comes by, and Garrett's had a wreck since I met him. But before Garrett's wreck, he was, we called him Ricochet Rabbit. Like, this guy has more energy than anybody I know. He's like, He's like a 85-year-old stuck in a, or 20-year-old stuck in an 85-year-old's body. Whatever. He's, anyway. So I meet these guys. I meet these guys. I don't want to belabor this, but I meet these guys, and we talk for a while, and I go to walk out, and Scott hands me a CD from a men's breakfast. I think you guys actually have a men's breakfast coming up, maybe your first one. Um, and Scott hands me a CD from the men's breakfast, and I kind of reluctantly take it, and we walk out to the truck, and Scott asked me a simple question. He said, do you know Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior? I'm like, yeah, sure. I mean, in my mind, I'm thinking I'm an American. Like, this is it's a stupid question. Of course I'm a Christian. And he says, well, what does that mean? And I was like, well, you know, I pray. Everybody prays. Like, Lord, Lord, just give me that promotion. Whatever. And he said, okay. He said, well, listen to that CD if you would. So I get in my truck, and he's standing there just waving, and I'm like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I just lied to that guy. I was like, he's a pastor. He knows Jesus. I just lied to him, and then all of a sudden, by my own confession, I realized I had a serious problem. I was like, wait a second. I just said he's a pastor, and he knows Jesus, and I just said that I lied to him. I just said that he knows Jesus. I just admitted that Jesus is real and that somebody knows him. I just admitted that Jesus is real, somebody knows him, and I don't. And I'm not a smart man, <laughs> but I know there's no good if there's a God and I don't know him. So I decide I'm just going to put in this CD and listen to it as I drive down the road. And I'm driving up the road, and Garrett was preaching on Genesis 3. That's why I chose to teach Genesis 3 today. Garrett was teaching on Genesis 3, and he gets to this verse right here. I'm listening to the sermon, and I'm like, man, this guy yells a lot. <clears throat> And he gets to verse 9 and says, where are you? And I about locked up the brakes and skidded down the highway. And I just stopped the CD. And I'm like, where are you? It was like God was speaking right to me. Where are you? God calls that in every one of our lives. He stands at the door and knocks. Where are you? You know when Elijah had that massive victory on Mount Carmel, he wanders out into the, into the wilderness and he's like depressed and just wants to die. And God asks him, why are you here? It's kind of the same question, really. Whether you're a Christian today or you're not a Christian today, the, the question's still the same. Where are you? And I hear that and I'm just like, I'm undone. I'm like, where, where am I? Well, I'm not in a good place, that's for sure, obviously, if you're asking me that question. Where are you? So I get out of the truck. I was actually looking. So what happens is every year the elk, the bulls, they grow antlers, and then they shed their antlers. And so I go out and I pick up their sheds. And so I'm going up to look for them, and I'm walking up this mountain, and I must have looked like a crazy person. I'm walking up the mountain. I'm like, where are you? Where are you? Where are you? Where are you? I'm just asking that stuff. That question is just going over and over again in my head. And finally, I get up there on the mountain. And I'm like, here I am, Lord. Here I am. 
And I walked down and I told my wife, we're going to start going to church. And she just kind of looked at me like, okay. And I told my brother and he thought I was crazy. I was making $300,000 a year at the time and I was totally dissatisfied with life. My wife and I got rid of the business that we had. I became an intern in the church under Garrett for, I started at $18,000 a year. There's a little bit of a difference between those two numbers. $1,500 a month, let me put it that way. I went from to now mind you when I was up here there was no joy there was misery there was affairs there was everything that you can imagine just horrible going on and then down here when I finally when I finally came out of hiding from the presence of the Lord the one place that I could actually find satisfaction when I came from there and I came into the presence of God I didn't even need money What do you need when God provides everything that you need? You need nothing to satisfy your soul other than your Savior. Now, I know we've all been there in times where we're satisfied and times when we're not satisfied. And that's why I asked this question, where are you? Because this question needs to be asked over and over and over again. I'm asking myself right now, where am I? When I'm bitter, when I'm angry, when I'm hurt and I'm retaliating and I'm rebellious, when I'm not satisfied with God, when I start looking to other things or depending on other things to make me happy or experiences to make me happy, I've got to ask this question, where are you? The presence of God. In God's presence, his fullness of joy. I want to close with this thought out of Psalm 84, verse 10. The psalmist, the son of Korah, says, better is one day in your courts than what? Let me put it this way to you. Maybe I can shed some light on this verse that you've never heard before. Better is one day in the presence of God than a thousand live for anything else. Let me bring some reality to that. Does anybody in here make at least $30,000 a year? Let's just use that really low denominator. $30,000 a year. Well, a thousand days is what? It's about three years. A thousand days is about three years. So in three years at $30,000 a year, that's roughly close to $100,000. Let's just call it, let's use round numbers here. I'm not a mathematician. I told you I'm not a smart man. Would you trade one day with God for $100,000? So in other words, if somebody came to you and said, look, I'm going to offer you one day to spend with the Lord, or I'll offer you this briefcase with $100,000 worth of cash. The psalmist says, better is one day. One day in the presence of God than 100 grand, than 300 grand. Better is one day like Jim Elliott down in Ecuador, serving the Lord with all of his heart, mind, soul, and strength and being killed then thousands of days of life going to the country club and sitting in church doing nothing with your life. It doesn't matter if you live 10,000 days or 100,000 days or one day. Better is one day lived with and for the Lord than anywhere else. Better is one day with the Lord than hundreds of thousands of dollars, than hundreds of vacations, than hundreds of Christmases. Better is one day with the Lord than all of that. Where are you? Are you taking the hundred grand or are you taking the one day? Because let me tell you something about the presence of God. If you know what God has asked you to do, and maybe God's asked you to do something scary, if God has asked you to do something and you're refusing to do it, you're not in the presence of God. And in fact, you're not experiencing fullness of joy. You're you're experiencing the chastening and the moving and the pressing and the pressure of God trying to get you to do that because you're, you're, you're trading one day with the Lord for a thousand doing something else. 
You're saving all of your money right now so that you can have retirement. What are you really doing deep down? I want my thousands of days, Lord. I don't want my one day. You know what? All we have is one day. All we have is one day right now. But Satan says, why have one when you can have a thousand? What if you get killed doing that? What if that relationship ends because you invite them to church? What if that relationship ends because you confront them on their sin to try and free them from the snare of the devil that's killing them? What if it ends? What if this one day costs you a thousand in the future? Well, God says this, better is the one day than the thousand. So I want to ask you one last time. Are you living for the thousand days? Are you living for the one day? Where are you? Are you in the presence of the Lord? Because in God's presence is fullness of joy. If the worship team wants to come up, I want to, I want to just, I want to challenge us right now. As a church, as God's people, like, can we huck it like Jim Elliott? If you're not aware of what Jim Elliott did, he went down to Ecuador and everybody said, you're going to die. And you know what happened? He got down there and they killed him. But before he died, he said this quote, a man is no fool to give up what he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. Look, nobody guaranteed you a thousand more days, but God has given you this one day. And on this day, what will you choose? Where are you? Because you don't have to stay where you are. You know what I love about God? Jesus, in John chapter 1 and verse 14, it says this, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus was full of grace and truth. You know what that means? This is how I interpret that. Jesus came preaching a message that it didn't matter what you had done, it matters what you do now. Just like the Backstreet Boys say, right? I don't care who you are, where you're from, what you did. As long as you love me. I got this, man. Just step back. (laughs) It doesn't matter what you've done. It matters what you do right now. Maybe Maybe you've walked away from the Lord. Maybe you're not walking close with the Lord. Maybe you've never even given your life to the Lord. I just want to give you an opportunity right now, before we worship, before we go, before you go back to your thousand days, I want to give you on this day, I want to give you an opportunity to get right with the Lord. And I'm not naive. I know there's plenty of Christians in here that need to get right with the Lord too. Where are you? If you've wandered out of the presence of God, if, you, if you've never walked with God, I want to give you an opportunity to stand up and make a commitment that on this day you are going to walk with the Lord and from this day forward you're going to walk with the Lord. And we want to celebrate that with you. We want to lay hands on you. We want to pray for you. We want to encourage you. We want to help you on that way. Romans chapter 10 tells us this. If anyone confesses the Lord Jesus with their mouth and believes in their heart that God has raised him from the dead, that person will be saved. Saved from destruction, saved from meaningless, saved from dissatisfaction, and saved by the goodness of God to God's presence. You know what it means to confess that Jesus is Lord? It means to say, God, I've gone my own way my whole life, and I want you to be the leader of my life, and I want you to lead me to life and life abundantly and life eternally. Jesus said in John chapter 10 and verse 10, I came to give life and to give it abundantly. The thief only comes to rob, kill, and destroy. It does not matter what you've done. It matters what you do now. And I want to give you an opportunity right now. If you need to do what is right and you need to get your life right with the Lord and you need to give your life to the Lord, I want to give you an opportunity right now to stand up and walk into the presence of the Lord.